Hello, I'm Professor Fan, and today I will be going through a single cell resolution spatial transcriptomics data analysis in R in preparation for my upcoming genomic data visualizations class. So to get things started, why don't I share my screen? And the genomic data visualizations class is um, you know, a class that's going to teach students about the principles of data visualization, but through the context of you know, doing a hands-on exploratory analysis of spatially resolved transcriptomics data. So as part of the class, they'll you know, learn about what spatial transcriptomics is, and then learn various ways to communicate about the data um, yeah, using data visualization, you know, um, and then also performing dimensionality reduction, clustering, and other things to try to explore this data and uncover hopefully some interesting underlying biology. Uh, so to you know get things started, I've already prepared a couple of data sets for the students. And today I will just be kind of running through the analyses to make sure that you know what I'm asking the students to do is feasible. And I'm gonna try to do most things in base R, just so that um, you know, you know, some students have uh PC, some students have Max, and some students have Linux, I'm sure. So we don't want to end up in dependency hell if we try to install too many things. And yeah, so I want to yeah, just first read in the data and, you know, we can double check that, yeah, this is part of uh, the utils package, which I think should be installed by default. Um, but anyways, yeah, last year, the students worked on uh, a couple of different data sets of mostly brain. Uh, so this year, um, switching it up a little to, yeah, to, to change up the data set and also make, make one data set and the four different data sets. I've, I've cut them up so that, you know, students can form teams and, um, yeah, and work together to analyze these different data sets that are technically of the same tissue, and hopefully they'll come up with similar answers as to what is this data. Uh, and yeah, so I've uh, yeah I've named the data sets after Pokemon, but we'll see if any of the students actually know what Pokemon are. Uh, so yeah, I just read in the data, and you can see that um, okay the uh, we always want to look at our data. So what are the, the rows are cells and they have so IDs and their columns are things like the cell centroids, area of the cell, and then these are all our genes. So I'm just going to reorganize it a little bit um, so that uh, you know, I can have everything um, renamed into variables that are more consistent with what I want to do downstream. Um, so the first two columns are of our data matrix, so the positions, an area, of the cells, and then genes, which will go from four to the, you know, whatever number of columns that we have. And, oops, one end call. Um, and always double check. Let's see, what does it look like? Yep. So we have the, our uh, area, and I want to actually make sure our area keeps the names. Oops. And the gene expression. Okay, that, that looks good. So, yeah, so, you know, we read in our data. And now, you know, before we do any serious data analysis, um, yeah, let's just uh, take a prelim look at, you know, what does the data look like? We can use the plot function, which I think is part of base. Um, yeah, the students will be learning how to use ggplot also, but I want to at least make sure that we can plot things in base and have everything make sense. Okay, that's a little ugly. I'm going to use... Uh, different PCH 
so that I can have little dots instead of circles. And uh, okay, so already you can see that there's some interesting you know, variation in terms of cell density. Each point is a, the centroid of the cells. So it looks like they're denser here and more sparse here. It's kind of interesting. Um, yeah, other things we can do is, um, yeah, I wonder, uh, yeah, other, yeah, let's uh, yeah, make sure we can do, let's see, yeah, we can do some summary stats and QCs. So let's see, I wonder what are the, yeah, if I look at the column sums, which would correspond to well, how many, for each gene, how many cells do we find have this gene detected? Yeah, what would that look like? Uh, oof. Okay, so we have some genes that are super high and some genes that are you know, pretty low. Maybe if I put this on a log scale and add a pseudo count of one to prevent infinites. Um, okay, that's a little bit easier at least to interpret. So huh. yeah, there's some genes that are detected in 10 to the five cells or I guess to the 10 to the 5 copies across all the cells. I wanted to see how many cells I could just make it plus zero, and this will give me a true to false, so that when I call sums, it will just count the number of cells that have this gene. And you know, how many cells do I actually have? It's n rows. Um, okay, good. Yeah, I've downsampled this data set so that it's kind of less than 10,000 cells so that, um, yeah, hopefully it won't overwhelm students' computers. Um, and yeah, so okay, so we have some genes that are pretty rare. Um, maybe they're lowly detected, maybe they're working rare, so, you know, rare cell populations. This will be up to the students to, to figure that out. Um, Okay, so yeah, we can visualize things as histograms of distributions. Um, yeah, why don't we also, you know, can also just pick a gene and look at it. Um, let's see, what is a, what's a gene that I actually recognize in here? Uh, okay, now I'm MS4A1, CD20. Um, it's a B cell marker that I recognize. Um, so yeah, even without doing any analysis, I just want to see just how distributed is this gene. Mm, yeah, you know, which are the yeah, which are the cells that express this gene? Which are the cells that don't? Well, maybe I'll first just yeah. Well, let's see if I do a oh, well, I can do a let's do a box plot. <laughs> That any helpful? Oops. Uh, oof. Um, ah, right, right. These are columns. That's why I should always oops, look to see. Yeah, I'm grabbing the, the vector that corresponds to the column. And there's 4A1 in the gene expression matrix. And OK, this is. Yeah, not a great data visualization, and you know the class will will we'll try to come up with uh, an explanation of why this is not good. Um, to be able to communicate, yeah, you know, why a data visualization is good and why it's it's not. Uh, maybe a histogram would be better. Uh, again, we have the well. I just log it. Mm. Okay, so yeah, most cells I think don't express this gene. Yeah, we have a small population that do. Mm, yeah, I wonder where are these cells in the population? Let's say, yeah, I want to look at you know where the cells are. So I guess I could do, yeah, let's say the the gene expression for MS4 one. It's greater than zero. Yeah, which which cells? And yeah, these are the indices. 
So then if I do no row names, these are the cells that express this gain, cells with CD20. Um, yeah, or I guess have detected CD20. And yeah, maybe just a double check. I want to take, like, just look, but see the, the range of the cells with, that I set up CD20. Yeah, indeed, it ranges from 0 to 11. And then I guess there'd be the other, yeah, other cells. So maybe I'll do cells without CD20 are the ones that are, I guess, zeros. Um, that should be zero. Yeah, okay, I did it right. Um, okay, so now I have cells with CD20 and maybe I just want to plot their positions. Um, whoops, I'm gonna, yeah, so this is where my cells with CD20 are. And uh, well, maybe I'll make them good. And then I have my cells uh, without CD20. Maybe I'll make them gray. Uh, oops. Yeah, maybe I want to put them all together. Can I do this? I just do add. Uh, no, I can't. I think I have to do points. Um, yeah, so I just want to see where are my cells with CD20 and where are the cells with that. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay, that's interesting. Um, so maybe, yeah, maybe we want to see, you know, CD20 marks B cells, as far as I'm aware. Maybe we want to see oh, what other cell types are co-localized. Yeah, that could be a fun uh, data visualization, visual exploration. Um, okay, but yeah, looks like the, the day looks sensible. Mm. The other way I can think of plotting this, um, yeah, like we split it up into a vector of cells with CD20 and without. Um, maybe if we pick another gene. Mm. Uh, you know, I might have other questions about this data. Now let's pick a CXCR. And two. Um, yeah, I could, yeah, essentially now I picked a new gene and I want to see how these two genes relate to each other. Uh, so I can have, you know, I have my cells, you know, with CD20 and cells without, but, you know, do these cells also express CXCR4? You no, know, that might be a you know, biology question we're interested in. Um, and yeah, how I would how would I use data visualization to explore that? Um, again, how is this gene distributed? Um, okay, we have you know cells with the expression of this gene, and yeah, maybe I'll just kind of use the same code. Now note this is like binarizing the data, so I just see the cells with and without. Um, with, yeah, well, it doesn't matter if I name this as long as I'm consistent with passing my new G2. And yeah, again, this ranges from zero to 25 is 10 to the 1.5, 25. That's pretty close. Um, yeah, okay, so with G, without G, uh, where are these cells? Oh, no, yeah, okay, at least visually they seem to mark kind of some of the same places. So then if I were to plot, hmm, yeah, I can plot the gene expression of, say, G1. Are my original G, MS41, with a new gene, CXCR4. Um, yeah, is there a population that has both? Mm. Oops, I'm gonna make them circles. Um, yeah, so, you know, there are some cells that only express G2, 
So you have CR4. So that's zero of MS41. And then there are other cells that express zero of CXCR4. And other cells that are positive on both. Ooh. Okay. Yeah, okay. So yeah, we can do this type of exploration and you know find our double positive cells, but um, of course, you know, there are so many other genes to look for um, and look at. Uh, let's see, how many genes are there? That's a good question. So yeah, we're looking at uh, 8,000 or so cells and 300 or so genes. So if we wanted to make all possible comparisons, I guess that would be uh, this many scatter plots. And then we probably want to do you know, all these other, yeah, not just positive for these two things, but also have other things. So yeah, there's there's no way we're gonna do all those visualizations. So we're going to kind of explore other ways of reducing the dimensionality. Uh, so that's where we do principal components analysis. And yeah, okay. So uh, if I was doing this for real, I would probably do be doing like um, our spectra, uh, SVDs. Oops. Yeah, so we can do a, that's just a faster single value decomposition, but we don't want to deal with installing that. So we're using PCR comp, PR comp, um, which should come standard. So we are just going to do, uh, yeah, PCR comp on the, you know, the gene expression matrix. Try log it. Yeah, let's log it. I'm not doing any other normalizations right now, just to see how it goes. Um, okay, that wasn't that bad. Thought that would take a lot longer. Uh, and we always want to check, you know, what are the outputs? Um, you know, we can also read about it. Uh, so I think what I want should be in here. And yeah, FPC is where my, um, yeah, and the dimensions of my cells. So yeah, what happens if we just plot the first two PCs? Well, again, I'm going to use this base R plotting. And okay, now well, looks like, uh, yeah, looks like there's kind of two populations. I wonder, now where are my B cells? Mm. Yeah, I wonder if I plotted, yeah, the cells that we identified as MS41 positive, yeah, where are they <laughs> in this schema? Uh, let's just do a quick check. Oh, cool. Oh, neat. Yeah, they're all on this side mostly. Hmm, it's kind of interesting. Um, yeah, well, I guess it'll be, yeah, I wonder. Um, yeah, how does, I don't know, the other principal components look? Um, okay, cool. Uh, but yeah, there's many principal components and they capture different axes of variation. I can also see, um, yeah, I wonder what are the loading values of my, you know, MS41. Um, yeah, it's a positive loading on PC1, negative PC3. Hmm. Okay, well, I'll be up to the students to yeah, explore kind of, yeah, what are these primary axes of variation? What are they capturing? How are they splitting up our cells into different transcriptional groups? But yeah, there are a lot of PCs. And actually, how much variance do the PCs explain? Um, yeah, so yeah, no point in looking at numbers if we can visualize them. I'm gonna visualize them and that was a line. Um, actually, how many are there? Oops. How many PCs did I compute? Oh, okay, just as many genes as I have. I don't want to visualize all of those. I'll just visualize 30. So yeah, so you know the number of amount of variance is being explained kind of drops pretty dramatically. 
maybe only well, maybe I'll only need yeah really 10 PCs to capture all the variation um, so I could yeah I could look through all of them now yeah, let's look through the ninth one whoops shoot okay good and um, yeah still capturing some variants I wonder what cells these are Oh, yeah, that's a, that's a good data visualization question. If I wanted to actually color the cells in space by PC1, how would I do that? Yeah, let's try to do that. So, yeah, let's take a look at PC1. Uh, it has all these numbers. Mm, yeah, I want to color the cells in space. Space. So I want to yeah, make this kind of a plot, but colored by PC1, mm, just to see how, yeah, how do the PCs actually correspond in space? Um, okay, so, you know, I know, yeah, okay, maybe to get things, the ball rolling, I know I can, yeah, how do I make a color ramp? Because I want to, yeah, I want to have a set of colors that I map these PC numbers onto. So I'm going to create a color ramp that goes from, say, yeah, say light gray to red. And there's going to be 100 values. And yeah, so if you know your hexadecimal colors, you can know that this is gray and this is red, RGB. Yep. So these are my colors. And I'll call it my colors. So it is a vector of length 100. And if I, you know, ask for the first my color, it's going to be gray. If I ask for the hundredth one, it's going to be red. So now I want to map my PCs to this range. So if I, let's see, if I minus the min and What is the range of this now? Now it ranges from uh, zero to eight. Okay, I'm gonna set that as uh, an X. And so I just wanna map my PC numbers to this to one to a hundred. So X divided by max X should give me numbers ranging from zero to one. Yep. And if I multiply that by 99 and add it to a one, that should range from zero to 100. And yeah, let me save that as y. And oops. And yeah, these are the numbers range, right? But I need to round them. Um, let me floor them actually. I think if I round them, I might get a 101. Um, Okay, yeah. So now I have, um, yeah, I mapped my PCs to a range from zero to 100. So if I just ask for my colors, oops, no why? This should give me colors that, yeah, map from my PC space to my color ramp. Okay, let's play. So I'll call that a uh, PC call. Um, so now I should be able to, um, plot my positions and color it by my PC call. That should correspond to PC1. Let's see if that looks sensible. Oops. Uh, okay. Well, maybe, yeah, maybe light gray to red is a little hard to see. Uh, let's see, yeah, so this is something we'll learn about in class about the perceptual, uh, I guess, human abilities to perceive between different hues versus colors, saturations, yada, yada. Um, yeah, maybe I can better, okay, yeah, I can better distinguish divergent color palettes. Um, so oh, that's pretty cool. Um, you can already start seeing some spatial patterns in PC1. Um, yeah, wonder, and again, yeah, maybe just a sanity check myself. Yeah, what happens if I plot, 
Yeah, PC one versus two and color by PC one. Well, then I should see a gradient if I did this right. Um, whoops, PC X. Yeah, there we go. Okay, okay, so I did it right. Um, yeah, so of course we could redo this for all our PCs, but um, yeah, that becomes a little tedious. So we can do other dimensionality, nonlinear dimensionality reductions to try to capture, um, yeah, transcriptionally distinct subpopulations built on our primary axes of transcriptional variation. So we are going to do TISNI, uh, T stochastic neighbor embedding. And yeah, this is the one area where students will need to install a package. I don't want to implement gradient descents from scratch. Um, yeah, so let's run our TISNI and let's make sure we you know, know yeah, what is kind of default. And yeah, I'm going to run it on, I think we saw that the first 10 PCs explained the primary axes or captured most of the variants. So I'm just going to use the first 10 PC. Um, oops, input is not a matrix. So what is the input? Oh, right, I'm running it on the Oops, I wasn't supposed to run it on the standard deviation vector. I'm supposed to run it on the principal components matrix, which is, yeah, always good to double check what is your input. And yeah, this is a matrix. Okay, so this should work. Uh, okay, now let's see. So it says to remove duplicates before running TISNI. Um, okay, that's a little weird. Why aren't there duplicates? Well, we can use yeah, this duplicated uh, function and base um, to figure out which yeah, which of my row, which of yeah, which of these things are duplicated. Uh, okay, there's a lot of duplicates. Um, okay, let's double check that they're duplicated. So. Um, okay, they are indeed duplicates. Um, yeah, basically the same duplicates. Uh, okay, I'm going. So, yeah, so it's not lying to us. Um, yeah, uh, they are indeed duplicates. So, we'll just now have to figure out why they're duplicates. It's a little suspicious. Um, okay, so. Yeah, again, these are yeah, the names of the cells are these. So if we go to the gene expression matrix, um, ah, okay, okay, I think I know why they're duplicates. Um, yeah, they're duplicates because if I sum up, all the genes are in these cells, and I look at a table of their distributions. Yep, uh, these are cells that we don't detect any of our yeah, panels. Any of the 313 genes that we've assayed, we don't detect any of them in these cells, or we detect like one copy, um, maybe yeah, one of these genes. So yeah, so this is uh, something I should have done. Actually, I should have done up here. Oops. What I should have done is this. Oops. Yeah, I should have looked at for each cell, how many genes do I detect? And yeah. If I had done this, which actually yeah, is an important part of QC, I should have seen that there are some cells that are you know, not very expressing much. Actually, I probably would have cut it off here. So that's 10 to the 1, 10. So I'm going to say good cells. Yeah, should have done this. Um, are the ones with row sums uh, greater than 10? Yeah, which? And if I had done this, 
them. Yeah, I can get their names. And then I could have, um, yeah, plotted on only the good cells or, you know, restricted my downstream analysis to only the good cells. Yeah, it still looks pretty good. Um, actually, where are the, where are the, all the cells? Whereas if I, yeah, I do points of the good cells and, you know, color it with the green. Um, okay, yeah, so there's some, yeah, okay. There's some cells, yeah, that are mostly here that we don't have anything, so. Yeah, maybe it's an artifact, maybe. Um, but anyways, yeah, we need to remove these cells because we don't have any information on them to do any inference on what they might be, um, at least transcriptionally, uh, based on these measurements. Uh, okay, so I'm going to just keep only my good cells. And same thing with my chain expression. I'm going to keep only the good cells. Uh, yeah, so yeah, we've we've now lost the yeah, we're down below eight thousand now. Okay, so now hopefully, yeah, we can again do our principal components analysis. Um yeah, PC's changed a little, but um yeah, I can yeah, just double check again. Yeah, what are, yeah, the, the trends with CD20 still look the same. Um, kind of patterns mostly, yeah, still looks the same. Yeah, this little giblet doesn't really impact much of what we saw before. And yeah, we can still look at our PCs with PC20 or principal component one and two, and then D CD20 is still kind of localized to one of the clusters. Um, that mostly is separating PC1 and is variable on PC2. Um, yeah, everything looks yeah the same as before, even though we filtered out now the cells that are not expressing anything. Um, yeah, this still looks kind of the same as before. Um, okay, so I think, yeah, hopefully that fixes things. And yeah, now we can run our Disney and Hopefully, okay, now it looks like it's not breaking. It's not throwing errors. Um, so, yeah, so we will see how that goes. Okay, so looks like our, our Tisney finished running. What is the output? And yeah, I can see from this that uh, yeah, what I want is in the y variable. Uh, yeah, so this is what we, what the artisme embedding actually, um, yeah, actually is. I'm going to set the row names to my cell names uh, just for my bookkeeping. And now I should be able to plot the embedding. Uh, just let's see what the density of it looks like. Um, oops, I don't. Uh, okay. Um, well, I guess there seems to be some clusters. Uh, so yeah, so yeah, finish running it. Uh, reduced our ten principal components down to two dimensions in a nonlinear way and the class will go over what is this uh yeah the, the statistics that's trying to minimize and okay so yeah so we we see some uh groups of things um yeah i guess that looks fine um but you know we might want to yeah do some actually identify what are these clusters, try to grab them out. Uh, yeah, I guess in theory I could mm, try to grab this group of cells that if they're close to each other in the TISME, you know, they're transcriptionally similar in PC space, which means they're transcriptionally similar in general. Um, yeah, I could try to like carve this out somehow. 
Uh, yeah, that's too tedious though. Um, so I'm just, I'm going to do a clustering in the PC space. Um, or I guess it'll be up to students to figure out which space they want to do clustering in. And I'm just going to use k-means. So yeah, again, we don't have to install anything. And I can do that Oops. on the first 10 PCs. Which sound, yeah, how many, how many centers? K means we have to specify K. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll pick 10. <laughs> yeah, I'll be up to, whoops. Centers. Can we yeah, double check if yep, it's centers? Um, okay, that was fast. And then, yeah, I will save my clusters as this clusters variable and okay good I've kept all my cell names um yeah so now let's see um yeah what clusters is a it's a variable that ranges from zero to one and the cells are annotated depending on yeah which k-means cluster they fall into um, I'm trying to I'm going to try to visualize this, but colored by my kinase clustering. Mm, so I, I need my I need ten colors, which I can get via rainbow. I have my red and let it whatever F, no G, the C. Oh, that's pink or purple. Um, okay, so yeah, these are different colors, and again, I want to map my clusters into these colors. I think, yeah, I think that's just it. Um, so yeah, these are my cell colors. And again, I want to plot the embedding, but colored by my cell colors. Let's see if this works. Oh, nice. Yeah. So yeah, looks like I have, yeah, my pink cluster is the, the one I was trying to isolate. Um, and yeah, I wonder if I colored my positions by these transcriptionally distinct clusters, you know, what would they look like? Oh, cool, neat. Um, yeah, looks like there's some patterns and it'll be up to the students to investigate, you know, whether, you know, well, what underlying biology this might mean. Um, and a part of that, yeah, will you know mean identifying genes that are upregulated in each of these clusters. Um, so you know we can you know do uh, yeah, I think in the context of the class we'll just learn about you know t-tests and Wilcox and rank some tests. So we will you know, just want to make sure that students will be able to let's say Run a Wilcoxon rank some tests to identify genes that regulated. Yeah, let, let's pick this cluster here. Um, so this is, uh, yeah, cells of interest. Maybe I will um, pick which you know, clusters equals 10. Uh, let's get their names. How many of us are these cells are we looking at? Okay, yeah, that looks about right. Um, other cells are the ones who are not in cluster 10. Double check. Oops, other cells. Yeah, so this is um, yeah, most of our population. Uh, and yeah, if I pick my... Uh, yeah, let's pick a gene. Um, yeah, I guess we can just do our MS four hundred one again. Um, if I do the kind of cells of interest for this gene versus the other cells for this gene, yeah. So I have a I guess a a vector of values. Maybe I will do a plus plot. Uh, it's mostly zero. 
and compare it with the other population. That's almost like zero. Um, okay, maybe this is not the best choice, but yeah, we can still do you know, testing. And yeah, it's not significant. Um, okay, well, maybe I want to just try to find a significant gene just to double check that you know it, it does work. Um, okay, let's go back to our embedding. Yeah, maybe we'll go kind of the other way around. Uh, yeah, so we have our embedding. And let's say I want to color my embedding by my, yeah, I want to color it by the MS401 expression again. Um, yeah, so yeah, why don't I yeah, do kind of this thing again, except now instead of plotting um yeah plotting the the cells in space I will plot it on the Tisney so I can see which which of these populations kind of has an this way one uh so again yeah there's cells with cd20 cells without cd20 and now I will just plot the cells with cd20 mm. And just double check the cells uh, without CD20. Um, okay, so I guess it looks like you know, maybe my cells with CD20 are like there. Uh, probably not the best chain to have picked because it's so sparse. Mm. Yeah, it also doesn't seem like it's coming together to actually form a B cell cluster. <laughs> Uh, which you know, suggests that maybe you know, there's other things I need to be doing, like actually normalizing my data. Um, yeah, but anyways, um, why don't I pick a different gene then, just to sanity check myself. Uh, yeah, let's pick uh, row sums with the gene expression, whoops, no, oh, call sums with the gene expression matrix to get the, you know, which, I just want to get like one gene that's really highly expressed. Um, and ah, okay, uh, herb two, her two, and uh, just gonna change my variables. I guess I don't have to. Um, it's bad practice. Fine, I'll just leave it like that. Uh, but uh, yeah, future me is going to be confused because I didn't name the variables well. But uh, maybe future me will watch this video. And OK, so we have cells with ERP2 and cells without. OK, that covers kind of everything. Um, yeah, maybe I'll pick something slightly less. Oh, what about this one? Something less highly expressed. Um, okay, well, I guess it's it's kind of tends to be higher here and maybe lower here. So if we pick a, yeah, the reason why I'm doing this is just so I can sanity check that our proposed differential expression analysis is going to return relevant results in theory. Um, so if I pick a cluster here and compare it to these cells, it should pick up, you know, um, mom as being upregulated. So. Let's see. Yeah, so if I pick one of these clusters, um, yeah, which are the clusters that would match to green? Um, let's see, rainbow 10. Um, let's see, R, G. This is a G. This is also a G. Um, yeah, let's pick this one, which is one, two, three, four, five. Let's pick cluster five. Um, yeah, let's double check. Yeah, cells of interest are in cluster five versus not cluster five. I think it's matching this one. Uh, but actually, why don't we double check that? Um, if we plot the embedding of cells of interest, 
uh, let's show pick up yeah that area yep um or i can just plot the embedding and then have the points yeah okay yeah well, good to double check um and now i should be able to look at well i'm in the cells of interest that should be reasonably high as we've predicted or hypothesized before whereas yeah it's uh, much lower in the others um and now if i do a wilcoxon test it should be significant yep. good and yeah we actually probably want um yeah a one-sided test we want it to specifically like look for things that are um greater yeah because we want it to be upregulated in our cells of interest not necessarily yeah, we're looking for positive expression markers uh in this case maybe maybe there'd be a interesting reason to look for low specifically lesser than um, but yeah if we were to do a one-sided test we can distinguish between the genes that are significantly upregulated versus the genes that are significantly downregulated and yeah and i guess it'll be up to the students to you know learn how to write a loop to loop through all the genes and to you know, find everything um but yeah all in all uh it looks like you know we can we can do some qc we can do some basic visualizations we can do qcs we can do principal components we can do tisney we can do k-means clustering and differential expression so yeah, I think everything I'm asking the students to do should be feasible. And yeah, with that, um, yeah, I think students should be all set. And uh, hopefully, yeah, if you are uh, joining Genomic Data Visualizations in a few weeks, um, I will see you in class. And hopefully this will also be a useful study guide yeah, for when you guys have to study for your finals after, you know, all this is done and uh, you'll be able to look back and see, um, yeah, have this all make sense. And yeah, and if you're joining us for another reason, then I hope that this uh, video was useful. And uh, thanks for tuning in.